Okay, we're now recording uh, the uh, the final the final leg of our uh, Western mystery tradition, and we're going to trot through this real fast because I would like to get through it in an hour. So we're going to talk about all the synthesis, the spiritual synthesis that has occurred in the 20th century and, and is occurring in the 21st century, and we'll get some idea of specifically where our own traditions fit in that. Now. In the 20th century, there's so much to talk about. There's the whole worldwide theosophical movement in England and Australia and India. There's the independent episcopate, the, the independent bishops and uh, the bringing of the apostolic succession out of the Catholic Church into the old Catholic and liberal Catholic and the Gnostic churches and so on. There's the development of the Golden Dawn, attempt to reconstruct a great magical school based on uh, bogus credentials from Rosicrucians and things like that. And uh, after that, the development of uh, Paul Foster Case, who left that thing in his, his BOTA organization, which has trained a lot of people in esoteric knowledge and so on. Uh, Alistair Crowley, Uncle Al, and uh, the uh, OTO, which has uh, uh, taken some, some bad turns and some good turns. We have some people that are with us that are associated with us that are members of the OTO, which is a very, which operates in a very good way. And then there are also people that operate in not such a good way. So it's, you know, when you get into the esoteric world, you have both types. Uh, there are the English magical schools, W.E.B. Butler and pagan paganism, big revival of that and Egyptian things, beyond fortune and so on. American Rosicrucian schools, the distance learning Rosicrucian school, Amor, developed by Spencer Lewis, Heindel's group that's still down in Ocean City, Climber and so on. A lot of this was happening in California. California is a funny place. Geologically, it's a place that's been slapped onto the, the, the coast of America through the migration of lots of different parts of continents, uh, especially Marin County, which is made of places from nine places all over the world that have been the uh, added because this continent was originally just ended at the Rocky Mountains and then all the rest of it was scraped off and uh, so California has become a place that has people from all over the world and spiritual traditions. Uh, the whole business of psychic research that developed after the American Civil War and the development of uh, psychism and, and psychic uh, experiences that people had uh, that went into Duke University with uh, the Rhines and other people trying to research. Um, we had a, a, a major uh, uh, mile, mile uh, stone in uh, east-west relations when Vivekananda, who is a major disciple of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, came to this country and uh, the end of the 19th century and stayed in a home in New York City and uh, expounded what we know as Vedanta, which is the great teachings of the Vedas uh, and uh, development of other East meets West things. Yogananda, who's uh, one of his teachers, Sri Yukteswar, uh, came up with the idea of the New Age and the end of the Kali Age as opposed to what was normally accepted among uh, uh, Jyotishis and so on in, in India. And this is where the whole New Age language developed. Uh, we had the development of Sufism in, in England and, uh, and um, then in America. And uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan is, is really the person most responsible for what we have over here, Murshid, uh, Sam Lewis, and so on. We have uh, many pagan traditions. Uh, what we think of as witchcraft or Wicca, Wiccan traditions really were created by a fellow named Gardner. We call it Gardnerian witchcraft. Uh, at the beginning of the century out of uh, uh, several bits and pieces of things that he put together and uh, Druidism was revived and various kinds of Celtic revivals. Uh, Gnostic Ecclesia developed along the lines of, uh, uh, of uh, Freemasonry with where you have three degrees of initiation and all kinds of things. The same thing with Martinism. And uh, Pythagorean traditions uh, were revived, and one of them we're going to look at is a tradition of who is called the Magus of Stravolus. We're going to look at his his surviving 
uh, Shela, who is Daskalos. And uh, the study and interest in occultism, Manly Hall, who has uh, uh, passed away. Uh, I, I had fortunate, uh, was able to spend a, a day with him at one time. I told you about that before. And uh, now his uh, philosophical research library uh, sponsors degree programs and things. And uh, people were interested in, in investigating these things. There were also Nazi groups, Black Lodge groups, people that uh, developed out of uh, German nationalism and so on, uh, both the consequences of both World War I and World War II. Uh, there were Rosicrucian movements that came to America. Uh, Bishop Serenarian's father was a Rosicrucian Grand Master, an Armenian Rosicrucian Grand Master. He went through mystery rituals and things in caves. The Duke de Palatine and Bishop Heller uh, came here and brought Gnostic ideas um, and there were various <coughs> French orders that transplanted themselves recently in the, in the 20th century, about midway through the 20th century, over into America to avoid political restrictions that were starting to be placed as uh, the movement towards European unity also became a movement towards restriction of religion. Uh, and then there are all kinds of native U.S. New Age movements that uh, we talked about, all the spiritualism and all the things that happened in the United States uh, in the last century, in the 1900s. Here we have the development of the I Am movement, uh, Mount Shasta, uh, and the unity and various human potential things. And then Edgar Cayce, who was repopularized later. Spiritualism was repopularized, and then in the 80s we have... Uh, New Age world celebrations and things like that going on. And uh, new mystery schools. We have the, the Tibetan diaspora. The, the Dalai Lama and his people are forced out of their homeland and their capital. And so, somehow this brings this to the world, to Europe and America. Kabbalistic schools in Israel uh, start to uh, open up and go public in the 50s and the 60s. And uh, various other kinds of things that develop at this period. So going back to Theosophy, Annie Besant was the person who sort of took over the movement after uh, the time of Madame Blavatsky and she had developed a protege, a little boy, uh, that she had adopted, that she had all kinds of prophecies about would be the new avatar and the new master of things. We call it, his name is Krishnamurti. When he got to be uh, 16, 18 or something like that, he renounced all that and he said, no, you're wrong, I'm not the new avatar. And he sort of went off by himself and <laughs> after she had done all of her things. Uh, and he, however, became a great teacher and taught people many kinds of things. The liberal Catholic Church uh, was part of the Theosophical Movement, Annie Besant, uh, was uh, we see a picture of her worshiping in robes and we, we wonder if possibly she was maybe one of the first clandestine women bishops or priests but we don't really know the answer to that. This is Bishop Charles Hampton um, being enthroned. He was the consecrator of Bishop Spruitt. Now Charles Hampton is a very important person in the liberal Catholic Church movement because he was the person who made the decision that his priests did not all have to be theosophists. And this is by about the, the 50s or 60s, middle of the century. And that caused a big rift between the European theosophists or liberal Catholic Church people and Americans. <coughs> and so uh, our tradition comes through Bishop Spruitt and through Bishop Hampton, who freed up people's minds to be uh, uh, not have to be just strictly theosophic. And theosophy had gotten very, very crystallized at that point. So this is uh, Charles Hampton. After his, uh, the, the, the head of the entire liberal Catholic Church was in England, and he uh, uh, demanded that all the property of the liberal Catholic Church in the United States, which I believe was in Ojai, be confiscated and taken away from these people. And there was a big court battle that went on. And uh, the Americans finally won the right to use the name and this sort of thing. Now, 
I talked to you about the order of corporate reunion, how in the 19th century uh, there were many lines of apostolic succession, and there were uh, a clandestine group of Anglican clergy and some other people who wanted to gather together through subconditional reconsecrations of bishops the uh, the lines of succession which were all out individually into various cultures and various separate churches third world churches and things like this and they begin bringing them together and uh, to establish finally a, a lineage of 16 lines of succession that were all battle lines of succession well we today have about 22 extant lines and the home temple transmits all of them and they were finally synthesized I was the last synthesizer uh, through uh, me and Bishop uh, Boyer back in the early 90s uh, but uh, the Pope even the Pope does not have all of these 22 lines of apostolic succession today because some of them are Gnostic <laughs> Bishop Anthony Aeneid uh, who was uh, an Orthodox exarchate um, was sent over to this country to minister to Polish and other congregations of Orthodox congregations and he was given the exarchate powers which means <coughs> he could make his own rules he didn't have to follow the Orthodox rules and the Orthodox rules were if you didn't teach Eastern Orthodoxy you could actually be unbishoped which you can't be done in the Western Augustinian tradition uh, but uh, he came over and he proceeded to make uh, concordates with other independent bishops and he brought valid Eastern Orthodox lines of succession into uh, the independent bishops. Uh, Mar Johannes and Mar Georgius, who was the Patriarch of Glastonbury, who were independent bishops in uh, in England, uh, were some of the, did the, some of the final synthesis that the Order of Corporate Reunion had started a hundred years ago. Uh, this is uh, done through subconditional consecration. It's called con con subconditiones. And by, 19, by 1956, Georges and Johannes had accumulated all 16 known lines of succession at that time. Uh, this is uh, in the early 70s. Bishop Spruitt, who was my consecrator, had synthesized 21 lines. And this is a picture taken of Mar Johannes and, and uh, Mar Georges in the sanctuary. Uh, this, uh, this picture scandalized some of the American bishops who said, ah, women in the sanctuary shouldn't be allowed. Mm. See, we don't let women into some of our places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the French Gnostic apostolic succession uh, comes uh, from two kinds of things. One we call the spiritual succession uh, that comes through Douanel in the 19th century. And the other one through Fabre Palaprat, who after the end of the Revolutionary War in France, the <coughs> French Revolution, declared that, that Gnosticism had come out of the closet. And had come out, and, and we in fact do have about 200 years of Gnostic bishops earlier than that, that, uh, that, has, uh, that we have now in our succession that was brought to us. But all these were, uh, were transmitted to a fellow named Bricot, and he established what we call the, the French Gnostic Church, the Église Gnostique Universelle, and passed that down to Blanchard. And the line divides at that point between those that go through Ambulin and, and so on, and uh, those that came through another source that, that most, French <coughs> most French Gnostic churches now see as their main succession. So we have the, the, we have the, 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 the French Gnostic apostolic succession. We also have an English Gnostic apostolic succession that came out of the French and then became totally English. So this succession from uh, to Fabre Palaprat, who uh, was active in the first decade of the of the 19th century, uh, includes those that we think might have been held by the uh, Knights Templar. And these are what we call spiritual succession from Duanel, who was a spiritual powerhouse, and he established what we call the Church of the Paraclete. And, uh, and then his, his, he was kind of like Martinist lines. It, was, it started with a person who was a spiritual powerhouse and then became eventually apostolic lines of succession through 
uh, bringing them into his uh, uh, into his tradition. And this is the point where they all came together uh, in the 19th century. And this is where we are today with the, the Gnostic lines. Now, these are the basic lines also for the English lines of succession, which came to us through uh, people like the Duke de Palatine and so on. Which is the Gnostic. Uh, Richard Duke de Palatine is an Australian brilliant man who uh, was not only a bishop but he was a grand master of many traditions and he was a great spiritual teacher and I still have some of the tapes he made. He was Bishop Heller's teacher. I've heard him, I've heard him giving Bishop Heller hell on the tape. He was a very strict and difficult master. <laughs> um, and from the order of corporate reunion he brought together and synthesized other, other lines of succession. And uh, he uh, associated with the French Gnostic bishops, and he established what was called the Pre-Nicene Gnostic Catholic Church, which is an English Gnostic Church that George Boyer heads now, with other names. George Boyer was the successor of Duke de Palatine, and he gave all of the charters that he had received from the Duke to me uh, back in 1991, when he came to America and we did a subconditional reconsecration of both of us. Bishop Stefan Heller established the Ecclesia Gnostica in this country. He's Hungarian, and this is his web address, and he was the one who uh, initially uh, uh, ordained and uh, uh, brought Rosamund Miller into all of this many years ago. And uh, he was uh, the one that we saw very recently uh, at the consecration of Bishop Miller's new church. He was consecrated by Palatine as the regionary bishop of the pre-Nicene Gnostic Catholic Church in 1967. <coughs> and that would be in America. And he continued after the death of Palatine as the Ecclesia Gnostica in this country. And then he established an association with the Gnostic Society and some other people that had been established in uh, uh, Los Angeles back in the 1920s. <coughs> he held services and classes for many years at Manley Hall's Philosophical Research Library in Hollywood. And at one point, the way I got to know him, at one point uh, there were people who were students of Sarah Darian on the board at, at the Philosophical Research Society who were trying to get Heller kicked out of the of the society. It's the most petty stuff. And um, so Heller was very angry with Bishop Sarah Darian. Now Heller was a friend of mine. You see, I was a Gnostic scholar in the university and so on. But he uh, he had written a very angry stuff to Sarah Darian because he was blaming Sarah Darian for the actions of this idiot on the board who Sarah Darren knew nothing about. And I ended up mediating between them and things got worked out. But I was much more impressed with Sarah Darian as a, as a spiritual being at that time <laughs> and the way he handled himself. Uh, so he, uh, Bishop uh, Heller recently moved to permanent quarters in, uh, in Los Angeles. And there he is. And uh, he was the, the person who really kind of brought Rosamund Miller into all this and ordained her and consecrated her and so on. And uh, she wanted to have a little different name than his. She wanted to really kind of get out from under his thumb. And so she consulted with me and she finally decided to take the name Ecclesia Gnostica Mysteriorum. She consulted with me on the Latin, I think. But she doesn't call it that anymore. She just calls it the Gnostic Center. Uh, and it's in the Palo Alto area. And there she is, gorgeous lady, and uh, with her cats, and she's in her 50s now. And she has a ministry to people with AIDS, and she goes around to all the time.
Now, if we look at the founders of Theosophy, uh, here's Blavatsky at the bottom, and you'll see Henry Olcott with the long beard. He was a very highly respected American military man who followed her around and helped her put out her works and do things like this. Uh, this is him at his desk in the early part of the century. <coughs> And uh, this is W.Q. Judge at the bottom. And K Judge was uh, a member of Blavatsky's New York group. And it was he and the several people that uh, founded the Halcyon, the Th Halcyon Theosophical community that is here in California that you will learn more about. So that's W.Q. Judge. Um, the international headquarters of Theosophical Society is in Madras, India. Uh, this lady is a lady who had done a lot to, to advance that. The Theosophical Society literally saved uh, uh, Indian dance and established uh, Indian dance and a lot of Indian handicrafts and arts. Because you remember the, uh, the, the, the attitude of the British towards the Indians that they were dark-skinned, inferior human beings. And uh, the Theosophists, on the other hand, wanted the Indians to be their teachers. <laughs> So they did a great deal to establish the respect for India and Indian tradition, and Hindu tradition. And this lady was uh, the person who put together a lot of the great, uh, the dance schools that preserved the dance forms and so on. I've sponsored uh, Hindu dance concerts and things, incredibly complex uh, things, and it's been saved from being destroyed by cultural progress. Well, here's a website. You can uh, philosophy, theosophy splintered. Uh, in the key to theosophy, Blavatsky <coughs> said, uh, when she was asked about the future of theosophy, she said, and remember this is theosophy with a capital T. Theosophy with a small t is sort of what uh, Tofa does. Theosophy means a study of the wisdom, the divine wisdom in all traditions. And that's, it goes back, you can talk about theosophy with a small t, that's what was going on in the Hellenistic period with many things. But Theosophy is a big T, is, is, a speci is, a, is an incorporated uh, religious educational movement that has an inner section and an outer section and is associated with the liberal Catholic Church and so on. And she was asked about the future of this movement and she said, if uh, it doesn't get all crystallized, if it is willing to grow and listen to the new voices that come in, it will become a very important thing and it will provide a language for a spiritual language for humanity. Uh, but if uh, it, otherwise it'll just crystallize and become flotsam and jetsam on the beach of history. Well, it's done both of those things. It's given us all the language we have, karma and all that kind of stuff, but it's also crystallized and grown into some very unserviceable forms. So uh, it did not remain in unity. It did split apart very quickly. Uh, it was a very powerful force, but bickering among the schools led to disunity, especially over the issue of a successor to Blavatsky. Uh, Annie Besant and her uh, issue about her messiah, who was uh, uh, Krishnamurti and so on, caused people like Rudolf Steiner and most of the German theosophists to disassociate totally with uh, the Indian theosophy that she had established, and <coughs> she met her match in a woman named Tingley, who uh, said she was the legitimate successor to the successor of the son, because the successor of the son uh, uh, was another person in between, etc. So uh, this is uh, Rudolf Steiner, who was, uh, who's established anthroposophy and was a very important force in Europe split away from the theosophical thing and he called his anthroposophy and at Cretona in Ojai, California we had uh, a split between uh, a very talented theosophist, a woman named Alice Bailey and the, the theosophists who were there uh, and Bailey was receiving messages and doing all kinds of things and she, they, she was kicked out of the theosophical society and she founded her own kind of theosophical movement, which, by the way, Bishop Sarah Darian was very, very committed to, Alice Bailey form. Um, she was uh, demitted from theosophy at that time. So all these splits occurred. Uh, that's Alice Bailey. 
and she began the Alice Bailey School. And it developed uh, a great deal, it mixed in a great deal of Vedanta with a lot of teachings uh, that she brought in through her own kind of higher triad. I wouldn't call it channeling because it wasn't lower channeling. And, uh, and there, there's a whole library of the Alice Bailey literature that people should become familiar with. Uh, so here are some 20th century uh, theosophists. Uh, this is the lady Tingley, who uh, on, the, on the left side you see pictures, earlier pictures of Annie Besant when she's younger, when she's older. And on the right side you see a picture of Tingley, who in America took on Aunt, uh, Besant and really started a powerful movement in Los Angeles. <coughs> so the issue was that William Q. Judge had a document from Bovatsky that made him his, her successor, but Olcott, who had traveled with Bovatsky and Besant, were opposed and said it was a fraud. And so Tingley was a close associated judge and defended him, and, and he appointed her as his successor. So here you have the split, it's like Protestantism, you know how it goes. Uh, so there we have, uh, do anybody know who that is? That's Leadbeater, who uh, uh, established his school in Australia and was really responsible for uh, the liberal Catholic Church and a lot of the, the uh, liturgical metaphysics of it and all this sort of thing. His books are still worth reading. Uh, this is Duke de Palatine, Richard Duke de Palatine, also from Australia. This is Nicholas Rorick. The Roricks, uh, Rorick was a brilliant Russian uh, who designed the sets for Stravinsky's original Rites of Spring and things like that. And he and his wife, who was also equally brilliant, <coughs> uh, Helena, Helena translated all of the works of Blavatsky, which had been composed in English, even though Blavatsky was a Russian. She translated them into Russian and brought made uh, Theosophy very important in, in Russia. And uh, Rorik had students uh, among uh, high government officials, even uh, as high as the administrative offices in the United States. And uh, he uh, was a great artist and painter. And he uh, established some rules that were adopted uh, before World War II began that saved most of the great artworks of Europe from being bombed by either the Nazis or the Americans. But he died during the war, so he never won the Nobel Prize for that. But you'll find the works of Rorick uh, in, in lots of places on Rosamund Miller's altar. This is Rorick's work right here. This is uh, the Aura Flama, the, uh, the symbol that you find in Tibet of the, of what he interpreted as the marriage of uh, art, science, and spirituality, and so on. This was Helena, his wife, who was very brilliant. Uh, these are some Indian uh, Theosophists who had a great influence in uh, in, in India. These are Vietnamese theosophists. Uh, theosophy spread all over the world. Uh, this is a, an important theosophist in uh, in England and America, Jeffrey Hodson, who wrote uh, a lot of interpretive works. If you ever want to really understand theosophy, and it's very difficult to read Blavatsky's works, you can read Jeffrey Hodson. Uh, this is Alice Bailey. And that's uh, my dear friend and mentor, Bishop Tor Torquem Saradarian, who passed away in the 80s. So here were some very important people. Theosophy was a very important form. It bridged the gap between East and West. It gave us a language to use that as a starting place for lots of us to understand world religions. Um, there are many theosophical communities today. This is the community in Wheaton, Illinois that does the publishing and so on. Here's their website. Uh, this is the Crotona Institute in Ojai where Alice uh, Bailey was kicked out. Crotona was the name of the philosophical school established by Pythagoras and so on. It's a beautiful place. A lot of people are retired and own homes here and they have quite a nice library here. 
but the theosophical community that is closest to my heart is Halcyon, which is down uh, <clears throat> not too far from Pismo Beach. It was established by Blavatsky's New York group in the late uh, 1890s and by William Q. Judge and others, and by Francis Ledoux and, uh, and a medical doctor who came down to establish a tuberculosis hospital. That's Francis Ledoux. She uh, was known as Blue Star. This is the symbol of the Theosophical group, and it comes under the Master Hilarion. And Hilarion is very important to me because I've had personal contact with Hilarion. The community built a temple which is in the form of a heart. It's a rouleau triangle. So all, all the places that are equidistant from uh, the ends of the triangle at all things, people come to study it archaeologically because it's built uh, through sacred geometry, but it's not ad quadratum from the square. And it's not uh, from a circle, it's from the, uh, basically a, a rouleau triangle, which is a, a special kind of triangle. It's a, it's a triangle you can use as a wheel, and it'll, it'll, it'll roll just like a wheel. Um, so it looks, it has this kind of a shape. At the center is an altar, which is a time capsule. It has a lot of the important documents of their founding. And then the main altar that they use is at the back. However, the altar is not in the east, it is in the west. Uh, and it has a certain number of pillars, a certain number of windows, a certain number of uh, uh, cross, uh, cross beams in the windows. Everything has been built by sacred geometry. And this is the usual theosophical representation of Hil the Master Hilarion. Hilarion was a, a, an acquaintance and friend, a great master who was acquaintance and friend of Blavatsky that she mentions. He disappears and goes east into Tibet and people never hear of him until much later. But that's the way they represent the Theosophy as a child. So here's the Temple of the People, and un an unfortunate choice of names, <laughs> because uh, that's the place where, uh, the name of another place where people were massacred. Here's the temple itself with uh, the uh, posts and the pillars, the certain number of posts and pillars and windows and things, and people do come to study it archaeologically. If you go in, and that's, this is where the priests uh, dress to come in to do the rituals. If you go inside the building, uh, you'll see that uh, chairs in this case are set up around the central, a central altar for a special ceremony, but normally the altar in the west in the back is the one that's used. They burn uh, incense made of uh, that they recipes they got from American Indians, from Seneca Indians. They have pictures of uh, the masters on the wall and of the founders. Uh, the uh, original founders. These uh, this is Hilar this is another picture of Hilarion. Uh, the original founders, uh, Francis Ledoux, and uh, uh, the doctor that worked with it, and and. and judge and most people uh, were initiated into Seneca lodges, Seneca Indian lodges, and so they and also they have quite a big thing about Hi Hiawatha as a master and as an American master and so on. This was one of the, th this is the next to the last uh, Grand Guardian who was a painter, uh, and this was the one before that, and the, the current one is a good friend of mine. Um, and here we have William Q. Judge and so on. And uh, the connection with uh, American Indian spirituality, here we have Blavatsky. Uh, Blavatsky and the early theosophists were very much in awe of American Indian spirituality. Uh, now this is another building called the Halcyon University Center. They have a lot of things here. That's what the old building used to look like when it was a TV clinic and uh, what it was back in the early days and the plan of the city. It's now a whole city. This community owns all this land and about half of the houses. And uh, Will and I are actually members of this community. Uh, this is, these are some old pictures that you show in this place. So this man uh, was a painter and uh, he died about 10 or 15 years ago. And his paintings pretty much center on uh, the spirituality of Hiawatha and the Seneca Indians and so on, 
the uh, lodges they were initiated into, and they're very gorgeous paintings. Uh, and he was making what you might call New Age spiritual paintings long before anybody but uh, Rorick was doing them. And uh, these are very often themes related to the teachings they have uh, that they get from American Indian uh, teachers and shamans. So uh, this is going kind of fast, but this is a, a representation of Hiawatha. He always appears with the, the eagle. And uh, Hiawatha is, is known more as a politician to people who are, uh, see him as a made peace between tribes, but he was understood as a master who gave teachings and so on. So this is how he appears in the paintings. Um, this building is used for all kinds of meetings. In the early days, uh, this was a place where artists came. Some of the greatest American composers were members of this theosophical community. And in fact, I was there when the Library of Congress was trying to get some of the original works out of their library for the Library of Congress for some of the great American Five composers and some of the others. You'll see a picture of some of them here. They publish a journal called the Temple Artisan that comes out um, every so often. These are some of the great uh, artists and composers that were members and they would put together mystery plays and compose music for them and so on. This is what the grounds look like outside of the community. Uh, it's really quite large and uh, the roads are not really quite paved. They don't have to manage them, but there are a lot of homes built there. This is a fellow that is a friend of ours that took us around. He's European. Dr. Dower and Francis Ledoux were the founders and that's Dower and Ledoux Lane. <laughs> These are the, some of the houses that some of them lived in a long time ago, but they're members, they're, they're owned by the community now. And they have a lot of beautiful houses here. And, and you can buy these houses and move into them and, and you have a choice of being or not being a member of the religious community. Um, but uh, as you can see, they've got quite a, quite a spread. It's a gorgeous property. They even have their own uh, post office and grocery store. And they have a library, the William Q. Judd Library, with the original chair that Blavatsky used to sit in in the New York group. And I had some very, very profound experiences uh, there uh, in that library doing vigils overnight before the, the uh, symbols of Hilarion appeared uh, as stigmata in my hands and so on.
So the liberal Catholic Church uh, was established in this country as the liberal Catholic Church International after the split. You see, uh, Hampton uh, made theosophy optional for priests in 1942, and Pigott in the United Kingdom, who was the, really the presiding bishop of the whole thing, suspended him and all of his, preachers, his priests and confiscated the property at the regional headquarters. And so Hampton's, Hampton's following, which was most of the Americans, formed the LCCI, which is the Liberal Catholic Church International. Um, there was a court battle and for the name and the property, and the Americans eventually won. Uh, Ray Wardell became presiding bishop of the Americans uh, back in 1943. Uh, the church still referred, refused to ordain women based on Ledbetter's dogma that women couldn't be priests. Uh, Bishop Spruitt, Spruitt, however, who was a Hampton protege, consecrated a woman as a bishop. My teacher, Mother Jenny, not long before she died, a few months, he consecrated her as the first and only woman bishop in the United States that I know of up to that time. There had been one in Canada after he broke from the LCC and created the Church of Antioch. Uh, I, out, I interviewed outgoing Bishop Neth, presiding Bishop Neth and presiding Bishop Beckin, of the Liberal Catholic Church International at their headquarters in Ojai in the late 1980s about this issue of women's ordination, which is the reason I finally left the Episcopal Church. Both were sympathetic, but said that their congregation would never accept it. And so that's why when, Ed, you informed me that they finally had accepted it, I was very interested because I thought they were still all crystallized there. Uh, the head of their seminary was Lawrence Williams in line to become presiding bishop and I ended up finally giving in to him and consecrating him, although I tried to convince him to hold his breath and stay in line so he could make some changes, but I ended up consecrating several bishops out of the liberal Catholic Church to become independent, uh, and uh, they felt that it was crystallized and fossilized and it was not going to go anywhere, and it really was at that time. So um, I consecrated, I think, a total of four liberal Catholic keys to priest independent episcopate. Uh, but in 2004, the Synod changed its rules and now accepts women clergy uh, and has changed radically. The church has changed. Here's a website for the LCCI, the Liberal Catholic Church International. And here's the thing, during the 2004 Synod, Approved items included removing all gender impediments to holy orders. Women and men are now ordained as priests and consecrated as bishops in the liberal Catholic 